Right. So my name is Steve Miller. I'm a professor at Williams College. This is continuing education lectures on calculus. And this is Wellesley College, uh, Wellesley College, Wellesley This is Wellesley High School, a beautiful new building. And what I want to do in the beginning is talk a little bit about the underpinnings of calculus, where it comes from, and try to emphasize a little bit where there are some subtleties. And please let me know, you know how things are going, where you want me to stop and spend more time, where I'm going um, too slowly, where I'm going too rapidly, if there are applications you want to see. There are some that I'll talk about later. But what I want to do is, how many of you do proofs in your classes? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the subtle issues that you might not be aware of when you're doing the proofs. So for instance, the derivative of x to the r, and since I'm in Boston, I don't have to worry about how I'm pronouncing things, <laughs> is r x to the r minus one. But you have to prove it three different ways depending on what r is. And so I know a lot of times when this is done in an integral calculus class, there's a great opportunity to show how this relates to some discrete math and some advanced mathematics because you have to prove it different ways in different ways. All right, so almost everything in calculus starts with the definition of the derivative. So there's a couple of ways of writing it. We normally write it as f prime of x is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And sometimes you might write it as f of x naught plus, I'm sorry, maybe f of x minus f of x naught over x minus x naught and take the difference um, as to take the limit as x approaches x naught. And so you'll hopefully draw things such as, you know, here's my function f, here's my point x, here's my point x plus h, and I can draw the slope of the line connecting them, and in the limit, as h goes to zero, this is going to approach the tangent to the curve at this point. And the question is, when does this limit exist? And if it exists, how do you compute what it is? And so we have lots of different formulas to compute it. We have the rules of differentiation. And what's wonderful about the rules of differentiation is if you learn how to take the derivatives of certain basic functions, you can then use the rules of differentiation to take the derivative of more complicated beasts. Integration is completely opposite. We, in general, cannot integrate functions. We have to work very hard as teachers to find functions that have nice integrals. We don't have the same tools. Uh, in terms of you know, proving the differentiation rules, are people comfortable with how you prove things like the product rule, the adding zero, and that technique? Okay. So, was it a yes or a? No, I was asking who of you does the, the proof of calculus if you actually write out the proof. But then what, did you write out the proof? Add, yeah, well, yeah, and they sort of adding zero, but it, it kind of goes over them a little much. So yeah, it mean, comes early in the year and then not quite early. But the, the adding zero and multiplying by one are two of the best tricks we have. I always tell my students, I know two ways to do nothing. <laughs> and then if you take the log, because whenever you see a product, you want to take logarithm and convert it to a sum. Well, the log of one is zero, so we really only know how to do one thing in mathematics. And it's all about how do you add zero, how do you multiply by one. And just you know, trying to emphasize that the goal is to create an algebraic expression that you can understand, that you can see a pattern in, is extremely difficult. It's very similar to the auxiliary lines in geometry, where you know, if you're trying to find, say, a proof of the Pythagorean theorem, you know, the standard proof of the Pythagorean theorem has all these different boxes coming out, and I've never understood that. There are other ones where they have these boxes, and they break it up into 15 different shapes. The one I like the most is drawing the altitude like this. And when you do this, you now have three right triangles that are all similar. So if this angle is x over here, this is y, this is another 90 degree angle over here. Well, since this is 90 degrees over here, this is also x, and then that must be y. So you have similar triangles. And so since you have similar triangles, you can then use this to come up with relationships. And in the next um, class, we'll probably talk about how you can use this to prove Pythagoras. But the real difficult part of the proof is figuring out how to draw this auxiliary line. So when you're doing all this stuff, it's trying to figure out how do you motivate the students so that they're not just following you line by line, but if they have to do something themselves, they will see how do I add zero, how do I multiply by one, how do I think about doing stuff like this. Okay, so we know how to use the rules of differentiation. I'm not going to go through that. Let's talk about derivatives. So let's find the derivative of x to the r 
it is r x to the r minus 1. So when you prove this in your classes, how do you prove this? Okay. Positive values of R, okay. negative values of R, and later on we'll do it for the whole. Okay, so how do you look for positive values of R? So, let's see. Uh, I have it written down here, okay. what I do. Um, let me, let me do okay. it so I don't make stuff, stuff up while we're talking too. I mean, I'm making stuff up, honey. <laughs> <laughs> you should have the same rights and privileges. There's, there's some interesting subtleties in this, and this is why I wanted to have this as the first example. Because you know, if you ask any calculus student, I've asked all of my students at Williams, they all know that the derivative is rx to the r minus 1. But the proof is actually a little bit more involved. The first proof you often see is you look at the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus h to the r minus x to the r over h. And then you want to expand this using the binomial formula. But for that to be true, you need r to be an integer. So if r is an integer, then you have x plus h, uh, let's, call it, let's call it an integer. And I've been trained not to write anything other than like an n or an m for an integer. So if I have x plus h to the n, this is x to the n plus n choose 1, x to the n minus 1 h plus terms in h squared or higher. So if you know the binomial formula, you can actually write down what all these terms are. In fact, n choose 1 is just n. All we really need is that the first term is x to the n, the next term is n x to the n minus 1 h, and every remaining term has an h squared. The reason is when we do the subtraction, the main term of x to the n will be canceled with this x to the n over here. The next term, the n x to the n minus 1 h, when we divide by h and then take the limit as h goes to 0, we'll go to n x to the n minus 1. And then all of this stuff over here, when we divide by h, it's still going to be multiplied by h. It doesn't matter how large the numbers are here in terms of n. You know, they could be n to the n to the n to the n to the n. Uh, one of my students gave a talk in Ramsey Theory on Wednesday, and in his talk, he actually had in a meaningful way this number. This number arises as a bound in discrete mathematics on something. We believe the actual value is 9. We can show that it's at most 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 1200. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how large these numbers are. All that matters is it's some fixed numbers times fixed things in x times h squared, h cubed, h to the fourth. So when we divide by h and send h to the zero, these terms won't contribute. So you don't need the full strength of the binomial theorem. And one way you can see it looks like this is we have n factors. And so for each factor, we have to choose an x or we have to choose an h. So how can we get an x to the n? The only way we can get to an x to the n is we choose x every single time. And so that gives you the first term is x to the n. How do we get the x to the n minus 1 h? I can choose an h here and then an n everywhere else. Or I could choose an x here, an h here, and then an x everywhere else. And you see there's nine locations, I'm sorry, there's n locations to choose the h. And that's where the n choose 1 comes from. So it would be n x to the n minus 1 h. And you could continue arguing along these lines for the other terms, but there's really no need. So this is then the proof in this case. But what if r is not an integer? If r is not an integer, we can't use the binomial theorem. So I'm, I'm just curious, has anybody proved it? Positive integer or any integer? Any integer. I mean, if it's a negative integer, we can use uh, the quotient rule right, or the inverse right. rule. So once we know it for positive integer, the quotient rule then gives it to us for negative integer. But what do we do if, n is, if r is not an integer? So did anybody prove this in their class? Because the because the binomial theorem crashes if we don't have. So let me talk about what you would do if R is rational. Can you use log matrix expectation? I'm sorry? Can you use log matrix expectation? Um, you would need to know what the logarithm is. And so eventually we will have to use the logarithm to get the general case of R. So you're definitely on the right track. You don't need that for just R being irrational. So 
if r equals p over q, let f of x be x to the p over q. Set g of x to be f of x to the q, which is x to the p. And so if we let this be our function g, now g is just x to an integer power. And now we can take the derivative. So we get g prime of x, and then over here, now we use the power rule. So we now get q f of x to the q minus 1 times f prime of x equals x to the p. And now it's just a matter of solving for f prime of x. Therefore, f prime of x is going to be, um, so this should probably be a p and a p minus 1 over here if we want to do it correctly. So now we just solve, we'll get p over q, then we have an x to the p minus 1 over f of x to the q minus 1. And now it's just a game of plugging in the algebra. So this will become p over q, x to the p minus 1. Now f of x to the q is x to the p. So it's, it's a question of what's the easiest way for you to do the algebra with your students. Do you want to just substitute, well, I know f of x is x to the p. I'm sorry, f of x is x to the p over q. I can substitute p over q and multiply by q minus 1. Or I could say x to the q is x to the p. Lots of different ways to do it. Um, I'll just substitute directly. So it's x to the p over q times q minus 1. So that'll, this will give us a x to the p, and it will have a negative p over q. So we get p over q, x to the p over q minus 1. The x to the p cancels with the x to the p up here, and then the negative p over q comes as a p over q upstairs. So this is how you would prove it if you now have x to a rational number. And I, I like this because there is a subtlety here which is often glossed over. Okay. Any questions about this one? So then the question becomes, what if r is not a rational, but what if r is a real number? So I'm curious, how many of you have done x to the r where r is a real number? But the students know that the answer is r x to the r minus 1. So one of the problems I have is that students have too much access to technology, and they are able to push buttons without knowing what they're doing. So the worst solution I ever saw was when I was a postdoc at Ohio State. Fortunately, it wasn't one of my students, but it was one of these large, you know, college basic algebra classes. And you had a car leaving at noon, traveling at 60 miles an hour. I'm just talking about the worst algebra mistake and the dangers of pushing buttons. So we had a car leaving at noon, traveling at 60 miles an hour. And then one hour later, a car was traveling in the same direction at 70 miles per hour. How long until they meet? So the really smart students noticed that, you know, car B is gaining 10 miles an hour. Car A has a 60 mile head start, so it'll take six additional hours for car B to reach. Most students actually just graphed it and had two lines and calculated where they intersected. One student wrote on their exam, this is a rates problem. Great. And then wrote, you know, where have we seen rates before in this class? Excellent. And then he wrote compound interest. <laughs> and so he set it up as there were two banks. One bank was giving you 60 miles per hour of interest. The other bank was giving you 70 miles per hour of interest and try to calculate at what point will the interest given by the driven banks. And because he had a calculator and he was allowed to hit buttons on a calculator, it spit out an answer. It was not a reasonable answer, but he couldn't look at the problem and see, you know, was this reasonable? So when we talk about what is the derivative of x to the r, r is real, what does it even mean to calculate x to the r? If you ask me, what does it mean to calculate x squared? That means multiply a number by itself. I can do that. x cubed, multiply a number by itself, and then multiply it by again. If you say, what about the square root of x? 
Well, if I want the square root of x, I'm asking what number times itself equals x? Okay, so I can take a guess, multiply it by itself, and see does it equal x. If it's too big, <coughs> make it smaller. If it's too small, make it larger. So I can understand what it means to do x to a rational power, but what does it even mean to do x to a real power? So when you talk to your students, they can just hit that calculator button, and it will calculate you know, 5 to the square root of 2, and it will spit out an answer. But so the question is, what does it mean to calculate 5 to the square roots of 2? So part of this is supposed to be you know, continuing education, what goes on, what's going on in the background. If these things are boring, you know, please you know, show disgust on your face or send comments later, throw things at me. Can I go back to what you just said? Sure. So to, to do this proof for the power rule of uh, rational exponents, right. they, have to, they have to already know about implicit differentiation. They have to know about implicit differentiation. Um, well, you, you, you just need the power rule. You just need to be able to take f of x to the qth power, to an integer power. But because you're <coughs> on both sides, that for, for, for our oh, students, that would be a, a, sort of a new idea. Okay. So okay. It, it's always interesting as to how you would phrase it. Uh, because I have two things that are equal. Yep. So for implicit differentiation, I often think more of like x, y gobbled together. Okay. And so they're at least separated. So you just have x to one pure power on one side and f of x to a pure power on another side. Okay. But yeah, th there's a lot of ideas lurking in the background. And these okay. are... Sorry. Universally glossed over. And you're using the power rule for integer powers. No. You're using the power rule for I'm using the, I'm, I'm using the power rule for positive integers. So because we just proved it. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we proved the power rule for the simple function f of x equals x to the n. We then need to know, we need a very basic form of the chain rule. Because you're, you're, you're We're using use if, the chain rule. If a of x is f of g of x, then a prime of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to just use it in the special case where f is raised to the nth power. So what we need is we need the chain rule, and we need to know x to the n if n is a positive integer. So those are the two inputs we need. So you need the chain rule. So we need the chain rule, or we need just the very simple case of the power rule, which is a nice case of the chain rule. But we, we, for this, we basically just need special cases of the chain rule, but we do need the chain rule. There is more mathematics than you might expect in calculating the derivative of x to the r. So how do we calculate the derivative of x to the r if r is real? Well, the first thing is, what does it mean to take x to the r? So if I ask you, what does it mean to raise a number to the square root of 2's power? So what does it mean to calculate x to the root 2? I mean, your calculator will give you an answer. If I ask you, you know, what is 2 to the square root of 2? It will do that. In terms of what's the interpretation, I don't know that as well. I can, I can understand x squared. I can understand square root of x. x to the root 2, I don't understand as well. There's a couple of ways to do this. One is you could say this is the limit as you know, pn over qn converges to the square root of 2 of x to the pn over qn. So what we can do is we can take a sequence of rational approximations to the square root of 2. We could look at x to the 1, x to the 1.4, x to the 1.41, x to the 1.414, dot, dot, dot. And if we do a sequence like that, at every moment in time, we are just taking the number to a rational power. We understand raising things to rational powers. And then we just say that the limit exists. And then there's some <laughs> math under the hood here that there is a convergence that goes on. But this is at least one way to try to explain what do we need. You know, just take more and more digits in the approximation. And as you're taking more and more digits, it really shouldn't change this by too much. And one way you could see this is, you know, x to the 1.414 is x to the 1.41 plus 0 0.004. And then by the product, or by the exponent rule, this is x to the 1.41 times x to the 0 0.004. And then you would need to know something such as if you take a number 
to the zero of power, you get one. So as we take better and better approximations, we're going to be having our number here to a power that's closer and closer and closer to zero. So this term is going to get closer and closer and closer to one. So the limit will exist. It will stabilize. The amount we're changing by. And what you can always do is you can do upper and lower bounds. If I replace this with 0 0.003, it's too small. If I replace it with 0 0.005, it's too large. And you can do like a sandwich theorem type argument. So there's a lot of opportunities to use this as a springboard to talk about good mathematics. So this is one way. So the other way to say what this means is this is the same, and let me see if I can do this quickly, as e to the square root of 2 log of x. And now we're setting ourselves up for a chain rule, assuming we know the derivative of e to the x. And so if we use this, then the chain rule would be the following. So x to the r is e to the r log x. And this is where uh, college math and high school math have a conspiracy to make students' lives painful. In college, we tell students log is always the natural log because who would ever use any other base other than the natural log because we're doing calculus. Whereas in high school, I think you use ln for natural log, mm -hmm. and you use log to be log base 10. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I will switch and I will write ln. <laughs> I'm sorry? Doesn't the calculator write LOG for yeah. log base 10? Yeah. A lot of the calculators do LOG for, and they have a separate button that says LN, LN for yeah. natural log. Yeah. What's 1 over cosine? Inverse cosine. Secant. Secant. And what's 1 over sine? Yeah. Shouldn't they be the other way? Yeah. 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 So there's, 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 a, there's a couple of places in mathematics where unfortunately the notation is painful, <laughs> and you have to warn people, especially if you're doing physics. Physicists and mathematicians have different normalizations and different conventions for how they orient things. And so for physicists, sometimes they write down the transformation as it moves the chord of axes, and the mathematicians, it's moving the point. And so it's like a negative angle between them, and you just have to be careful what book you're looking at. So I, I will try to use ln to denote natural log. So I can write this as f of g of x, and here, my g of x, my inside function, is going to be r times the natural log of x, and my f of x is going to be my exponential function e to the x. And now, f of g of x is going to just be e to the r log x, or just x to the r. g prime of x, well, I use the constant rule. It's just going to be r times the derivative of log of x. So we need to know that the derivative of log of x is 1 over x. So this is r over x. So I will put a little star and say that I owe you a proof of that. <laughs> the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. I will put another set of stars over there. I owe you a proof of that. The point is to just see that it's actually much harder to take the derivative of x to the root 2 than you think. That students really do not understand how to take the derivative of x to the r. To do it properly, this is all the stuff you need. So if this is my function, then by the chain rule, a prime of x is just f prime at g of x times g prime of x. Okay? So what do I get? So I get f prime, which is the exponential, evaluated at g of x, so that's going to be r natural log of x. And then I have to multiply by g prime, which is r over x. Okay, well, e to the r log x, that's just x to the r. So I'll bring out the r, I have x to the r, and then because I have an x down below, it's x to the r minus 1. So this is a proof, and then I don't know if you do this in your class, but we put little squares filled in to denote the QED sign. We've reached the end of the proof. You can wake up now. I'm done doing these. <laughs> so this is what's needed. Uh, quick question? Yeah, I guess uh, maybe I'm not remembering the math, but x to the square root of 2 right. e to the square root of 2 log base 10 log of x. Yes. Um, Do you want me to show you, you want me to show that a little bit slower? I just, I, the connection between the, that jump for somebody like that to figure out what 
the algebra one to get that. Sure. So I claim x to the root 2 is equal to e to the root 2 natural log of x. So I'm going to go through another okay. proof. Yeah, I got it. I, I just needed to, he just wrote something on his Okay. Right, right, totally okay. So I was going to just take logs of both sides. Right. And if you take logs of both sides, then you'll get the log of x to the root 2 versus the log of e to the root 2 log of x. And now by the power rule, the root 2 comes out and get root 2 log of x versus root 2 log of x. All right, so now we know the derivative of x to the r, assuming we know the exponential function. So how many of you talk about the derivative of the exponential function in your classes? Do you prove why its derivative is itself? Okay. You can end up taking the take the natural log of both sides. Um, but how do you know? Let's see if I can just lower this ever so slightly. But how how do you know that you can take the derivative? And what are you taking the derivative of? I would like you to look at my proofs and tell me how bogus they are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. So if you so, say. So can I erase this? Is everybody? Because I mean, it, it is worth spending time on the function e to the x. That is one of the most important functions in mathematics. So the, the question is, how do you even define e to the x? So I, I know two different definitions of e to the x. The first definition <coughs> is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, which is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial. So that's one definition. The other definition is it's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus x over n to the nth power. So in both cases, there's an infinity going on. Whenever you see infinity in mathematics, this is a flag that something dangerous is happening, and you have to be very, very careful as to how you do things. What you would love to do is you'd love to switch orders of things. And so imagine, um, I don't care that this is being recorded. I love to make fun of economists and physicists. <laughs> Good physicists have a wonderful intuition as to when you can play fast and loose with the mathematics. And this is why they're often in high demand in Wall Street because they will be a little bit freer than the mathematicians who are a little bit more concerned about making sure that all the steps are rigorously justifiable. I remember my freshman physics uh, professor said, you know, in a math class, they'll spend six weeks justifying this step. Moving on, we see. <laughs> anyway, let's get to the good physics, and we'll trust the mathematicians to make sure that what we're doing works and makes sense. So what you would love to do is the following. Love to do the following. E to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus dot 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 dot. So if I take the derivative of both sides, we have a rule that helps us. What's the rule that helps us from calculus? Power rule and the sum rule. So the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. What's the derivative of 1? What's the derivative of x? What's the derivative of x squared over 2 factorial? x squared. x. x, right. What happens is the 2 comes down, and then the 2, you get plus 2x over 2 factorial, and the 2's cancel. The next term will have 3x squared, and I'm going to write 3 factorial as 3 times 2 factorial. And you'll see the 3's cancel. I'll just do one more term. Plus 4x cubed over 4 times 3 factorial. And you see, ah, oh, we just get back e to the x. Looks good. Looks good. <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. What did we do that's illegal? The dot, dot, dot. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, I forgot the dot, 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 yes. Uh, but. Plus, dot, dot, dot. Okay. 
Okay, now I have the dot, 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 okay. What is illegal? I could lose my license for this. <laughs> you have to prove that it converges for all x? So one thing is you have to prove that it converges for all x. Um, that's actually not that bad, and we can do that when we talk about series. So I, I, I will give myself that it converges for all x. But there's something else we have to justify. We're using a rule that you have not proven, but you may think you've proven. It's, it's, I, I have no idea. It's, is it zero factorial? So we define, um, it's not factorial. zero factorial, that's a good point. Zero factorial is defined to be one. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And so the derivative of one is just zero. We could write this as one over zero factorial. Right. And so okay. if you want to write it as one over zero factorial, mm -hmm. that's fine. But then we just have to remember that we don't write this as zero times negative one factorial. Although negative one factorial, I believe is positive infinity, so we're okay. Mm -hmm. um, as an aside, if people are interested later, um, one topic to show is that if you have negative one half factorial, that's actually equal to the square root of pi. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll show that later. Now, <laughs> just, just before we get back to this, what is, can somebody tell me what five factorial means? Three to one. Okay, sure. Three to one. X one has to be. Oh, sorry, yeah. yes, yes, thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So can somebody tell me what five factorial means? Okay, what's the interpretation of five factorial? So if you, <laughs> so if you have five people and you're assigning them jobs, how many different ways can you assign them where order matters? You know, so president is not the same as vice president. Uh, my favorite definition of vice president was, I think, by Bush Sr. when he was Reagan's vice president who said, you die, I fly. <laughs> my job is to go to funerals and express the condolences of the United States of America. Secretary, treasurer, they're all different. So five factorial is the number of ways to arrange five people when order matters. So the number of ways of arranging negative one half of a person is the square root of pi. So obviously, the factorial function does not mean the same thing when you evaluate it at non-positive integers. And so later I will talk about how to use calculus to actually make sense. And this is extremely important in probability, in the Gaussian, the normal, the bell curve, anything that has this many names matters. This is what you need for the normalization factor. So the illegal thing that's going on here is I'm saying the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Don't we have that rule from calculus? Didn't you prove the sum but, rule? But not for infinite sums. But not for infinite sums. You only prove the derivative rule for finite sums. So this is a great point to emphasize with your students. Whenever they see an infinity, be careful. What I'll do now is um, I will do an example where you cannot interchange two sums. And I'll show you that if you sum one way, you get one answer. If you sum another way, you get a different answer. That means there's something dangerous going on that to justify this, we need infinite sum rule. It exists, but it requires more care. One of the things you can do is you can look at you know, what's going on with the tail, try to approximate things. I don't want to go into you know, too much detail for something like this, but I want to give you a sense of what's out there and let you be able to tell the students, this is where we have to be careful. So let me give you an example where things go wrong. So this is the simplest example I know. So I'm going to imagine I have an infinite grid, but in the interest of time, I will only draw some of it. <laughs> but you know, if I'm running out of material, I will go back and just draw some more dots. And five, we need to do five hours? I'll go ahead. So I'm going to define the point to be plus one here, minus one here, and zero everywhere else. So I'm assigning values to a two-dimensional sequence A, M, N. So A, zero, zero is one, A, zero, one is negative one, A, zero, two is zero, etc. In the next column, I'm going to go zero, plus one, minus one, and then all zeros. In the next column, I'm going to go zero, zero, plus one, minus one, and then all zeros. And I'll do one more. 0, 0, 0, plus 1, minus 1, all zeros. And so it's natural to calculate the sum two different ways. So first, 
I could sum n goes from zero to infinity, and then I can do n goes from zero to infinity. Or I could do n goes from zero to infinity, and then m goes from zero to infinity. So what does this mean? It means I first fix an n, so the n is my height, and I sum throughout that row. What is this row sum to? What is this row sum to? What is this row sum to? What is every row sum to but one? Every row but one sums to zero. The first row sums to one. So if I do, if I fix a row, the first row sums to one, all the other rows sum to zero, so this sum equals one. Let's do it this way. What I do now is I first fix a column. What is the first column sum to? Zero. zero, zero. So if I do it that way, I get zero. I'm going to assume in the interest of time that zero does not equal one and we will call this a contradiction. This tells us we can't switch orders. So that's, is this some guy that said he proved God by showing that, is it one minus one plus one minus one? And he ended up with that same result. Is that the same thing that you're showing right now? The joke I know is given <laughs> 1 plus 1 equals 1, <laughs> prove that you're God. Uh, oh no, I think this is proof that, all, that everybody's the same. I am 1, you are 1, you and I are 1. It's not a physics <laughs> <laughs> So, there's a great theorem called Fubini's theorem. Yes. So Fubini's theorem is for multivariable calculus. It's when you can switch the orders of integration. And basically, if the you know, sum integral of the absolute value is finite, you can switch. And so the problem here is if I put in absolute values, then each row and each column sums to infinity. And I have infinity times infinity, and everything blows up. So what's going on here is I can have catastrophic reinforcement. I have a lot of fluctuations. And depending on the order in which I walk through things, I can align them differently. I could arrange the sums and make it sum actually anything I want. Instead of having just zero and one, I could have a more complicated way of summing it and I can get 1776 if I so desire. The real difficulty is if the sum of the absolute value is infinite, you have a problem. So I know that there was some desire to talk about sequences and series. So later we will talk about the geometric series. It's the best series we know. And one of the reasons it's so nice is that if you stop the geometric series, you know, one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth, and you chop it off at some point, What's left over is another geometric series. So you can then replace the infinite tail with actually a nice closed form expression. The exponential, you don't quite have that. But um, I will just end with you know, one thing right now for the exponential, and then I'll say that this is enough for just proving what the derivative of x to the r is. But you know, we do have to still justify this term by term differentiation. Okay, is everybody fine with the example here? Can this be erased? What's the catastrophic? Oh, you can switch the order. So for instance, yeah, the, the integral, you know, x goes from a to b, the integral y goes from c to d, f of x, y, dy, dx is equal to the integral y goes from c to d, integral x goes from a to b, f of x, y, dx, dy. So, and you can, instead of doing integrals, you can do sums. It's when can you switch the orders? And so, unfortunately, there are situations where you can't switch. Um, okay, so can I erase this? So, I, where do I was trying to yep. think about this? Um, so, your your example of how we can't add infinite sums is two dimensional, right? Yes. But when we're thinking about the value of death, right? One so, what we're doing here is we're inter we're trying to interchange two sums. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to interchange a sum and a derivative. So what we okay. want is we want d by dx of a sum to be the sum of the derivatives. Mm -hmm. And so actually, let me, let me take a moment and prove the sum rule. 
So I'll assume that you know the sum rule for two functions. That if you have you know, two functions, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. Let's say you have three functions, f plus g plus h, and you wanted to get their derivative. It's called proof by grouping. Have you seen these proofs where you just put parentheses in and group things? Okay, so you would write this as you group f and g together, and now we have two functions. And because we have two functions, the derivative of the sum of two functions is the sum of the two derivatives. So this is now f plus g prime plus h prime. Now I can use the sum of, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives because it's just two functions, and I get f prime plus g prime plus h prime, and now I just drop the parentheses. So this is you know, proof by grouping. And then if you use mathematical induction, you can go from having a proof for three functions to four functions to whatever, but it only works for finitely many. So you now know if you have any finite sum, the derivative of a finite sum is the finite sum of the derivatives. We do not have the leap to a derivative of an infinite sum is the infinite sum of the derivatives. And that's where the danger is. So it's, it's quite sad. <laughs> but it means that pure mathematicians have a job. <laughs> yeah, so. so earlier today we talked about how mathematicians sometimes have bad notation. You know, cosine should not be associated with secant. Sine should not be associated to cosecant. I do not have enough influence in the math community to get this changed. <laughs> and I tell all my students this. But every now and then, mathematicians define things well. It does happen. So what is e to the x times e to the y? Why? Why is that true? What does it mean to calculate e to the x? Uh, it's e times e times e times e times e. Times e. Times e. Times e. Times e. Times e. That's what e to the x means. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if this were not true, then we should be shot for this notation. Right? Sometimes <coughs> people write exponential of x. You know, we're defining the exponential function. The exponential function is either this infinite sum or it's the limit of the product. You know, the 1 plus x over n to the n. That's our definition of e to the x. What is e to the x times e to the y? It's the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, x to the n over n factorial. What's e to the y? It's the sum, I have to use a different letter, n goes from 0 to infinity of y to the m over m factorial versus the sum, k goes from 0 to infinity of x plus y to the k over k factorial. This is a product of two infinite sums. I have yet to see any student come to Williams who correctly understands what e to the x times e to the y is. The reason is because this notation is supposed to make you think, well, you just add the exponents. That's what we do for multiplication. You know, when we have two things, we combine the powers. <coughs> if this were not true, this notation would suck. You know, there's no polite way to phrase this. Uh, since this is being recorded, I will not go to stronger words than that. We have to prove that these are equal. If we don't prove these are equal, we can't combine exponents. So I will quickly sketch the proof. I will not worry about justifying the interchange. Uh, the exponential function converges so rapidly because this is a fixed number that everything is fine. And later when we talk about sequences and series in great detail, I'm happy to go into the nuts and bolts as to why things converge. Let me just give you the quick, fast proof. So I'm going to recombine these terms in the following way. I'm going to look at it as a sum. Um, J goes from 0.
0 to infinity, the sum L goes from 0 to infinity. x to the j over j factorial times y to the, oh no, sorry, I want to do x to the L. x to the L and then y to the j minus L over, and then this would be an L factorial from below, over j minus L factorial. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, look, I've got a bunch of x's and y's. I could have maybe x squared and y to the fifth. I could have x cubed, y cubed, whatever. I'm going to regroup them so that I always, you know, for each x, I'm going to look at which value of y do I need so that the sum of their powers is equal to j. So when I expand this out, if I want to have j equals 0, then I take the term of 1 from each one of them. So you know, if, you, if you want to multiply it out, it's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial times 1 plus y plus y squared over 2 factorial. And when I multiply it out, I'll have 1. Then all the terms that have it just to the first power, I'll have x times 1 and y plus 1. So I'll have x plus y. And then if I want to get the, the second powers, I could have x squared over 2 factorial times 1 plus x times y plus 1 times y squared over 2 factorial. The next level would be all the terms of degree 3. I would have x cubed over 3 factorial times 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial y plus x over 1 factorial, I could put a 1 factorial there, uh, y squared over 2 factorial plus 1 times y cubed over 3 factorial. And I'm just grouping things. And the advantage of grouping things like this is I'm associating terms together that have the same weight. You know, let's put all the x and y's together where the sum of the exponents is 0, some of the exponents is 1, some of the exponents is 2, some of the exponents is 3. So I have this is the same as this sum. Now I know at least one person here is doing discrete math. So the L factorial, J minus L factorial, does this remind you of anything? Where have you seen something that looks like this? I'm sorry? Yeah, permutations, right? You know, we have a, I'll try to highlight it in black. We have an L factorial over a G minus L factorial. It's missing something. What would you love to have with this? Oh, we have more colors coming in, excellent. So what, what would you love to have? What would you like to have? J. Almost, not j, but j factorial. j factorial. So let's just put in a j factorial, because if we put in a j factorial, you see now I'm going to go crazy with all these colors. Yeah. You know, then this whole thing over here is going to just become the binomial coefficient j choose l. Am I allowed to just multiply by j factorial? No, it violates the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. You can't do uh, unequal things to the sides of equations. Right? You have to treat things equally. So what can I do if I want to multiply by a j factorial upstairs? Divide. Divide. So then I just have to make sure I put in a 1 over j factorial down below. And as long as we do that, we've just multiplied by 1. So you know, again, it's all about doing nothing, but you're getting credit for it. So when we multiply by 1 like this, this over here, this is just equal to j choose l. And so I probably should have chosen the letter k rather than j. Um, and so now what do I get? I now get a sum j goes from 0 to infinity j oh no no, no this will be good. Okay. Uh, then I have a sum l goes from 0 oh, uh, l does not go from 0 to infinity. I'm sorry. What does l stop at? I, I want the power of x and the power of y to add up to l. What's the highest value of l I could take? Okay. J. So, you know, I can't have y to a negative power. Uh, one thing that's nice 
is it turns out that if you take factorials of negative numbers, you get infinity. So if you actually wrote infinity here, the way these are interpreted, you'd be dividing by infinity and the terms would, would vary. <coughs> but we stop the L sum at J. So we have J goes from zero to infinity, L goes from zero to J, and now we have J choose L, X to the L, Y to the J minus L, times one over L factorial. Well, the one, uh, one over J factorial. Well, notice that the one over J factorial doesn't depend on L. So it looks like, do you recognize this? This is the binomial. Right? That's just x plus y to the j. So we're left with the sum j goes from 0 to infinity of x plus y to the j <laughs> over j factorial. And now if you just do a search and replace wherever you see a j put in a k, then you get one. <laughs> this is what is needed to prove e to the x times e to the y is e to the x plus y. You can begin to get a sense of why we often don't do this in you know, middle school and high school. And you know, the question is, how much of this should you do in your classes? Do you, do, do you make comments about this for the advanced students? And you know, this could be a really nice math extra credit. You know, can you try to prove this? Or do you at least have them aware that something is going on? So you know, it, it depends on who your students are and what your class is, but there's a lot more going on to say e to the x times e to the y is e to the x plus y. Did you do, 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 do it or um, the equivalent professors of women for teaching calculus to their, to their students at Berkeley? What, what calculus did you take at Williams? Uh, multivariable. Okay. Yeah, I don't really remember. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I actually, I, I, I'm, I have yet to find Williams students who really remember what they've done in multivariable calculus. <laughs> Even when they take it it's at a lot Williams. Of work. It's, a, it's a lot of work, yeah. but by the time they get to the advanced math classes, they've forgotten what they've done in multivariable calculus. Yeah. And it's just gone. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's because you're calculating volumes of regions you hate. Yes. Uh, my, my favorite was when I was teaching at Princeton, I asked the students at the end of the <laughs> semester, so you, know, you had problems such as you know, two cylinders intersect at a right angle and find the volume of the region in between. Do you like these problems? And their language was emphatically no. <laughs> and I said, should we get rid of these problems for next year? And he said, oh, no, 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 we had to do them. We want the students next year to do them. <laughs> and I smiled and said, I've had this conversation so many years in a row now. <laughs> no, no one wants to break the chain. But we do a lot of problems that are just meaningless. So here, this is a problem that actually has meaning. There's value to doing something like this and seeing the subtleties of what's going on. Most students, uh, this is not really emphasized in the calculus courses. I don't think it's emphasized that much at Williams. People just assume that they've already seen this, and <laughs> my seniors are surprised by stuff like this. I think it's uh, dangerous for the idea of Williams that makes all that kind of rules of like, hey, x and y are just an unknown constant, and right. it's just a letter, and you have to remember x and y are just not just a letter, you know, that they're right. standing for all these different values, and this is a really powerful thing where you're saying it's that letter. It's not just, I need it multiplying by these things. Right, it's now does anybody here do things with matrices? Yeah. Okay, there is a formula for this where you replace x and y with matrices, and e to the a times e to the b is in general not e to the a plus b, it's only that if the matrices a and b commute. If they don't commute, you have an infinite sum in the exponential. And so there's a lot of interesting applications of this in physics, where they like to do exponentials of matrices to talk about how systems evolve with time. And you know, for me, the point is, you guys are pressured with so many things you have to cover, and I don't know how much you guys are pressured about the state exams, mm. that there's always this tendency to focus on that. But you know, whenever possible, to just let people know that there is fun stuff, and I do consider this fun, all this <laughs> stuff worth doing that's not just you know, busy work. <coughs> but you have to be really careful or some things are not true. As an aside, how many of you know Russell's paradox? Okay, so
So I, I hope you don't mind. This is you know somewhat of a free association. I have notes written down so it looks like I'm professional. <laughs> but part of it is I just want to throw out a bunch of things and I'm hoping that some of them will stick, some of them will be interesting, and some of them will be things you can use in class. So my parents are actually visiting my brother right now and they'll be visiting my family later today. And so I was you know, talking to my mom about what I'm doing and you're know, saying that this is the who gives a shit uh, part of the lecture as to why do we care about stuff like this? And now a lot of these words like that with us. So you know, the question is, you know, why are we spending all of this time proving things that are true? You know, it's true, we can just use it. Why do we have to learn the proofs? Why do we have to see the proofs? We could just do more examples. So the reason we do this is some things that seem true are not true. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, who's good at algebra? Yeah. <laughs> no one's good at algebra. I will do it as a collective. Yes, right. 16 over 64 in lowest terms. One fourth. One fourth. Excellent. Um, 19 over 95 in lowest terms. One fifth. Uh, 49 out of 98. Uh, 12 out of 24. Is that? Four. Right, it's four. Very good. Right. No, I, I, I just saw a message about a different way of counting that, that talks about when the two and the groups of four right. and how each No, they just cross off the two. Cross off the two. I mean, the way you divide <laughs> two um, numbers where the two digit numbers and the oh, anti diagonals are the same as you cross. Cancel. So 16 over 60 fourths is 1 fourth. 19 over 95 is 1 fifth. 49 over 98 is 4 eighths, which reduces to 1 half. And therefore, 12 20 fourths is just 1 fourth. <laughs> Proof by three examples. You could do that in the union of fractions. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what you could do is, if you want, is you could actually hold 49 98s in strategic reserve. So if says, you, know, you just do these two, that can't be right. Well, let's do another example. Let's do 49 over 98. <laughs> and so this is important, you know, patterns do not always persist. And so there's a real danger of extrapolating too far. There's a great quote by Mark Twain, a cat that jumps on a lit stove will never jump on a lit stove again, but will also not jump on a cold one. For each lesson in life, learn the appropriate lesson. And so here, so many students just do a few cases. They check a few things, and then they're convinced it must be true. <coughs> you either have to find an example where it doesn't work, such as this, or you have to be exhaustive. You have to make sure you cover all possible cases. OK, so this is you know, a, a fun example. Let me give you a more serious one that sounds mathematically impressive, Russell's paradox. So what I want to do is, th this is why we give a pr damn about proofs. This is why you have to be so careful, is statements that seem reasonable might be false. So for this, I need to talk a little bit about set theory and how things are done. You know, for the most part, we try to sweep this stuff under the rug. Um, you know, we can look at the set of baseball teams that are still in the playoffs. It is sadly smaller than it was you know, a few days earlier. Certain elements are still in the set, while other elements are sadly out of the set. Okay. You can look at the set of uh, Houston uh, baseball teams that have won a World Series. Right now, I believe that is the empty set, but it may change you know, shortly. So we can collect various objects together, and maybe what we'll do is we'll collect objects that have a common property. You know, there's some property that we want, and anything that has that property, you're all invited to come and join our set. Okay? So Russell considered the following set. And he came up with this example, um, you know, a little after around 1900. Frege was just finishing his great monumental work on an axiomatic foundation of set theory. And Russell said, what about the following? And it completely destroys the axiomatic approach Frege had in building. But he was very good about, yeah, this is a serious session that needs to be addressed. So R is going to be the set of all elements x such that x is not an element of x. No, 
Now normally we don't talk about things being an element of themselves. Very few things are elements of themselves. If you look at the set of teams that are in the playoffs, the elements of that, so <coughs> teams in MLB playoffs. So this is going to be uh, Evil Empire. Yeah, I cannot write anything else. <laughs> Dodgers, Cubs, and Astros. Is there anything, is this set an element of itself? Are any of these elements? No, they're not the whole set. Most things are not elements of themselves. You don't see as one of these things, you know, the set continues. You don't have this infinite chain going down. So it seems like most things are not going to be elements of themselves. So this essentially seems to be a fancy way of saying, let's just consider every possible thing you could think of <coughs> and just call that a universe of discussion. And because Russell did this, we'll call it R. So there are two things you could ask about R. And this is where it's so much fun to have a Boston accent. <laughs> exactly. Is R in R? So case one, R is in R. And what do you think case two is? Case two, R is not in R. Well, what would it mean for R, oops, sorry. So let's assume R is not in R. Well, R is all things, is all things X such that X is not an element of X. Since R is not an element of R, then R must be an R. Because R is the collection of all things that are not elements of themselves. So what do we know about case one? All right, so case one is bullshit. So it must be that R is an element of R. Well, you know, in the interest of time, I've got to fill up five hours. Let's explore the consequences of R being an R. Since R is all things X such that X is not an element of X, if R is an R, that implies <coughs> R is not an R. So what can we deduce about case two? Bogus. Also bogus. <coughs> what this means is you cannot form sets naively like this. You cannot just say everything that has a given property is a set. A lot of work needs to be done as to how do you build up your notion of what a set is. One way around this is to say that this is an illegal use of the, is an element of. That you, this leads to what's called Russell's theory of types, where you have things at different levels. And you can't talk about are you an element of something at the same <coughs> level, it has to be at a different level. But this required people to be very careful and it led to a new theory of sets where you have to be very, very careful about what is a set. <coughs> when can you collect things? So it turns out there's only one set which is clear that must exist, or not exist, depending on your point of view. The empty set. The empty set. Yeah. So the entire theory is built up on the empty set. So I'll do a, a really quick digression on this. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how you do things with the empty set. So we start off with the empty set. <coughs> what number do you think the empty set should correspond to? Zero. Has no elements. I can only think of one element, oh, sorry, of, 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 a, of one set that has one element. Can anybody give me a set that has one element? I don't have zero as a set yet. I only have one object that I know. Oh, the, empty. the empty set. So here is a set that has one element. It's the set whose one element is the empty set. What number should this be? One. Let me create a set with two elements. Anybody 
window of two elements. We have the empty set, and we have the set containing the empty set. What number should this be? Two. two. So if you want to make somebody's life painful, give them an addition problem like this. <laughs> Let's just do one more example. Can anybody give me a set with three elements? Now, I could also do the set containing the set containing the empty set, but so we'll do the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and then the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set. And then this is where uh, you look very carefully about all the different stuff. Okay. And then what I will do, I'm going to go back and use different colors. Just make it a little bit easier to see. I don't have you know whiteboards where I teach. I just use black. Oh wow. Hold it down just enough to show. All right, so this will probably be the end of the news for the day. <laughs> so here's a set with three elements. If you look carefully, you can see lurking in this set, here is zero, here's one, and here's two. Two is a subset of three. So basically, set inclusion corresponds to less than. And this is how some people build up the natural numbers. And so 0 is less than 3 because 0 is included in 3. 1 is less than 3 because 1 is included in 3. In pure mathematics, you can do this to then rigorously prove things, and then you forget about this, and you just work with things normally. But it's sometimes fun to see where things are, and if people you know, give you grief about why you're forcing me to prove things, we force you to prove things because of things like Russell's paradox, where you have things that seem reasonable, but turn out not to be. And that's the real danger, is you don't necessarily know ahead of time what's going to work, what's not going to. This is why you have to be very careful. My brother's an engineer. He does a lot of stuff with you know, Fourier transforms, signal processing. There are some dangerous functions that have very strange properties. They don't arise in what he does, but you have to be aware of stuff like that. Okay, so this finishes um, almost all that I wanted to say about uh, basic differentiation. The last topic was uh, you know, finding derivatives of inverse trig functions and stuff like that, finding derivatives of exponentials and logs. Do you want to see anything about how you find like the derivative of, say, Octangent or something like that? Yes and no are both acceptable answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's related to, I mean. I think that these, some people are going to have to go for a couple of seconds. Right. Like two more minutes. Right. So if you want to take a rest. Yeah, so I was, I was going to form it here and then when the bell rings, okay. stop. Perfect. And so inverse. Functions. So the goal is to find f in g such that f of g of x equals x. So if we can find two such functions, then f and g are inverses of each other. And so what I normally do with my students is I'll say, look, we have f of g of x equals x. You take the derivative of one part, I'll take the derivative of the other. So they'd only take the derivative of x, and they leave me the f of g of x. So you get a prime of x is 1, because the derivative of x is 1, is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So in particular, you get g prime of x is 1 divided by f prime of g of x. So if you know the derivative of f, you can actually find the derivative of g. So as an example, let's say a of x is the exponential of the natural log of x, or exponential log of x we want to end up pedantically. So I raise e by the number of powers of e I need to get x. So I'll just get back x. 
So if we substitute in, what do we get? We get g prime, so the derivative of the natural log of x, is equal to 1 over f prime at g of x. And what's my function f? My function f is just exponentiate. The derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function. So I just get e to the g of x. And that's 1 over x. So if we know the derivative of e to the x, we now get essentially for three the derivative of the natural log of x. If you knew the derivative of the natural log of x, and some people start off with that, then you can actually get the derivative of e to the x. Once you know one, you get the other. But you do need to know one of them. You can use this to get more involved ones. So how many of you have had to teach, like what's the derivative of arctangent? So do you do something like this to find the derivative of arctangent? Can you see the way that the book I said not findable? Right. And so for arctangent, so if you call this, if I want, can I erase the example here? Okay, I'll, I'll hang with for one second. So, uh, okay. so this, will be, this will be a good time to stop. We'll do our tangent when we come back.